Beste DenkTank luisteraar, welkom bij deze speciale editie van DenkTank de podcast. We zijn vandaag op Amsterdam Business Forum in Avers Live en we gaan in gesprek met de sprekers net nadat ze van het podium zijn gekomen. Ik ben Hans Janssen, ik ben vandaag niet de host, want ik ren de hele dag rond op het seminar. De hosting van deze editie van DenkTank de podcast is in handen van Christ Kolen en zijn speciale sidekick Carlijn Loertie. Veel plezier! Bij Denk Tank, de podcast vanaf Amsterdam Business Forum. For decades, companies have been talking on and on about the importance of empowerment. But why don't they do it? Because they don't have talent density. You can't empower your employees if you don't have great employees. And that's just, the two things just don't go together. Helping leaders and professionals of the Netherlands and beyond to become even better at their work. That's the goal of Denk Tank, the podcast from Denk Producties. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Christ Kohle, host of the show, and I am here together with co-host Carlijn Lorty. We are recording from Amsterdam Business Forum 2023, the biggest leadership conference of the Netherlands. And in this episode, we do not have one, but we have two guests for you. Aaron Meyer is a best-selling author, speaker, and professor at INSET, one of the world's leading and largest graduate business schools. Her work specializes in cross-cultural management, organizational culture, and multicultural leadership. Aaron is especially well-known for co-authoring the book No Rules Rule with Reed Hastings, CEO of Netflix. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. So nice to be here. And next to Aaron is Alex Jacobson. Alex is a former vice president HR EMEA of, by Netflix. She spent 13 years at Netflix and played a pivotal role in building the EMEA HR organization from the ground up. Alex is a commercially driven international HR executive with an extensive track record of building and sustaining healthy, efficient and high performing team. Welcome, Alex. Thanks. Excited to be here. Erin, our first question is for you. Um, it's been a few years, uh, but what made you decide to start a project on the culture at Netflix? Yeah, well, I'm an expert in culture in the workplace, but most of my work has been on national cultural differences. My first book, The Culture Map, was all about that. And uh, back in 2015, one morning I woke up and I had an email in my inbox from Reed Hastings, who's the the chairman mm-hmm. of uh, Netflix. And he said, oh, you know, I've been reading your book as we're getting ready for this international expansion. And I remember I showed it to my husband. He thought that it could not actually be Reed Hastings. It must be spam. <laughs> uh, in any case, so, um, so then I I started to work with him on their international expansion. And while I did that, I started to learn about this very um, unusual and disruptive organizational culture that they were experimenting with at Netflix. And I saw how it was leading to this incredible growth and also attracting so much top talent. And I wanted to see what it was that other companies could learn from this, this disruptive organizational cultural experiment. So then I conducted this big interview process. I I, um, interviewed hundreds of employees, including Alex, actually, at that time, um, about their experience. And I spent a lot of time with Reed. And then we wrote a book about the the findings. It is actually a great book. Thank Mm -hmm. you, Erin. And Alex, you worked for uh, Netflix for 13 years. What transformation, what did you see from the inside out? Like where uh, Erin and Reed um, uh, wrote a book about Um, I mean, what was probably most interesting and what kept me there for so long were the business transformations. But this is also where the culture also comes into play. So my first week at the company, um, they took me on a field trip to a DVD distribution center. And they had some new automated technology that um, helped them to put the DVDs in the, the red sleeves, the red envelopes more quickly. And that in that week was a huge deal. Fast forward to a month later, we're starting to to wind down the DVD business to to an extent, become a streaming company, um, expand internationally. Fast forward a little bit a little bit later than that, we're creating our own content. We are essentially becoming a studio, um, and then moving moving forward from there. All of a sudden, we're expanding to be true a truly global company, physically distributed all over the world. And like I said, what what kept me there was the fact that. 
it was not only interesting, it was like being at five different companies, but we had this culture that we built that actually allowed us to move through these transformations in a super agile way. It wasn't, it, it wasn't hugely disruptive because we had an employee base that knew how to shift and knew how to change. And we were willing to make tough decisions to support the business through these, these, these tra transitions. Wow, that must be really amazing to research on, Erin. Uh, What was your most, um, most striking insight when you researched that? Yeah, I think my kind of overall learning from this was just to recognize how the vast majority of companies today, and even what we're teaching at INSEAD, sort of like this uh, industrial era hangover. So, of course, during the industrial era, we were all obsessed with error elimination, consistency, and replicability. And if you are leading a manufacturing plant today or working in a safety-critical industry, those are still your goals. But in a growing number of teams and organizations, the biggest risk today is no longer making a mistake. It's, um, or losing out on a little bit of efficiency. The biggest risk is not being either agile enough, as uh, Alex was saying, or not being innovative enough so that the organization becomes irrelevant. And that just requires an completely different mind shift when you're thinking about how to set up your organizational structure. And I think what's even interesting about Netflix, so many people want to talk about the culture, which, which is hugely impactful. But what's most interesting about Netflix is how they were able to navigate through those huge transitions without effectively disappearing. Because there are so many examples of companies that just haven't, there's more examples than not of companies that haven't been able to do that. And I think that part of the Netflix story is so, so fascinating. Wow. And when you worked there, Alex, uh, what was most... Um what was the biggest thing for you? We heard about feedback diners and you, know, you have this feedback from all of the people on the table. But what was your hardest thing to do? What was the most challenging thing challenging. to do? Challenging, yes. Um, I mean, that's a long list. <laughs> long list? <laughs> yeah, that's a very long list. Um, when you're working in an environment that's constantly changing, um, a high-performance environment that's constantly changing, and you are trying to make sure as an HR person that your employee base is evolving along with the business, there are constantly challenges. But I do think um, one of the most challenging things on a high level um, from an HR perspective that we had to navigate through was um, maintaining this, this high talent density um, that, that, that Aaron talks about in her book that you constantly hear about Netflix, Netflix's commitment to. Um, maintaining high talent density in a super, super fast-paced business environment and in a company that is growing from 700 to 5,000 to 10,000 employees is a huge challenge. So, Erin, on stage you talked about uh, Fritz, <laughs> uh, but the people in the podcast did not hear your story, but I'm sure you can tell a little bit about Fritz because I think that's a really... A uh, clear example about how you deal with talent or not. Yeah. So let me just start by saying, I mean, Alex used this term talent density, which is a not a not a commonly used word, but is commonly used at Netflix. And basically the idea is that if you want to give your employees huge amounts of freedom, and the reason you want to give your employees huge amounts of freedom is that freedom breeds innovation. Right. Okay. So that's the premise of all of this. If you are going to, like most companies have lots of control mechanisms. Those are policies telling people what they can and can't do, processes slowing people down. And those um, control mechanisms, they, they prevent companies from being agile. And they also um, create an environment where people aren't free. So the top talent wants to leave. Okay, so we want to create an organization where we have really good people so we can give them freedom. And I think I'll, I should mention, I mean, for decades, companies have been talking on and on about the importance of empowerment, errant empowerment. But why don't they do it? Because they don't have talent density. You can't 
empower your employees if you don't have great employees? And that's just, the two things just don't go together. But once you've got great employees, then you can give them a lot of freedom and then innovation happens. Okay, now to your question about Fritz. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, so okay. Uh, the Fritz, I mean, that I gave, of course, on stage today, this, uh, this dilemma. And the dilemma was that you're trying to create a high-performing organization like Alex was talking about, and you do everything you can. You hire less people and pay them a lot more money and you throw yourself into training and coaching them. But then... Um, Despite all of your best efforts, uh, you at the end, you've got a really great team except for one guy, this guy Fritz. And Fritz, um, he's a nice person, and he does seem to be doing his best, but Fritz is clearly never going to turn in to the high performer that you hoped he would when you hired him. So then, you know, the question that I asked the audience is like, what are you going to do about Fritz? There isn't another position for him like that he'd thrive in. Are you going to fire Fritz? And you remember 50% of the audience said, no, we got to keep Fritz because we really want everyone to feel comfortable. (laughs) <laughs> and we had 50% of the audience who said, Fritz has got to go. So I do believe that that is a very provocative and difficult discussion. But if you want to have freedom, give your employees freedom, you have to have talent density. And if you want talent density, you can't keep your Fritzes on the team. Uh, there was a, there were some questions about the Dutch law, the cultural thing here. And maybe you, you know are important too. But Alex, when you're this hard on talent density and the Fritzes has to go, uh, even though they, they they would have a file, like you have to file that the, that performance. How did, did it work out in a, the Netflix organization with the Fritzes in the Netherlands? Yeah, I mean, the Netherlands and lots of different countries in yeah. Europe have um, very specific and strict labor laws. And, uh, you know, of course, we knew that when you when you decide to, to hire employees on the ground, you have to be willing to work in the confines of that, jur- that country's jurisdiction. However, the reality is that the outcomes can actually still be the same. And ideally, the underlying principles around how you make these decisions— which is we want to maintain high talent density. So Fritz is, is probably not going to have a, a long career of the company. Um, we want to make sure that we are giving Fritz regular, candid feedback. Um, and, and that might be in the form of, like you said, making some sort of formal file, um, you know, that which pretty much means writing it down, um, and in, which is in fact very helpful for, for someone like Fritz because it really helps to cement the feedback, right, and into place for him to act on. Um, But at the end of the day, the outcome is still going to be the same. The tactics that we use to get to that outcome in the U.S. versus Japan versus the Netherlands might look different. But if you have a strong set of underlying principles that you're committed to, then ultimately you actually can have some sort of consistency all around the world in terms of how you maintain that talent density and have those hard conversations. Maybe I'll just add. So I've lived in, I'm from the U.S., but I've lived in France for 22 years, and my husband is French. And uh, when I first started doing the research on this book, um, the Netflix was not in France. It had just recently started in the Netherlands. And I remember that my husband said to me, my French husband, he said, there is no way that Netflix is going to do that in France. He said, Reed cannot do that. It's not possible. <laughs> and, um, you know, okay, so they say at Netflix something very provocative, which is adequate performance gets a generous severance. And what they said after their expansion into Europe was, um, in Europe, adequate performance performance gets a more generous severance. <laughs> so, um, and you just have to be willing yeah. to um, to have, to, to allow for some grace and space in the timeline, right? It's not the U.S., and that's okay. So we have a different timeline, and yeah, it, it may be that it ends in a very generous severance, and that's okay because that that's what's typical here, um, and, and that's, that's the context that we're working in. You were uh, head of HR EMEA. Yes. And we're talking about all these cultural differences. Um, What difference did you see in your role in the different countries that you were working on? Um, I mean, there's there's huge differences. I actually think what's interesting is the starkest difference, and maybe this won't surprise you, was actually between our colleagues in the U.S. and our colleagues in Europe on the whole. Um, and, and actually in EMEA, because uh, we, we had folks represented from the entire region. Um, while EMEA 
is actually a weird construct in itself mm. because it's it's just a you know a bunch of countries that actually don't have very many cultural similarities lumped together. Um, but it's funny the EMEA colleagues actually operated with a little bit more harmony with each other mm. um, and had a harder time interacting with our American colleagues. Um, so I, I do think that some of the biggest differences were were between the the American the Americans and, and the EMEA colleagues. And I think fr- if I'm being really frank, and I'm saying this as an American. Um, folks in the U.S., and this has really been highlighted to me working here here in Europe for so long, we are just simply taught that we're the center of the universe yeah. from a very young age. And that translates into business as well. And that can actually be very damaging to employee morale and, frankly, to business outcomes. And so Netflix as a company really had to move fast in, in, in learning how to truly act and operate, not like an American company, but like a global company. And I have to say, we in EMEA did a lot of pushing and had a lot of uphill battles to, to get us there. But but you say, uh, like, the U.S. is centered around the idea we are the center of the world. Yeah. But you said it's a damaging idea for some. Yeah. But it can also maybe empower you to feel, I'm here, I'm a business, <laughs> come do business with me. Yeah. But uh, can you tell us a bit how this damaging thing works? I mean... Aaron, maybe you can back me up on this. I think France is a great example. Um, there have actually been several American brands that have tried to to go into France sort of as is, and they haven't been particularly successful. And when they become successful is when they actually figure out how to fit their product to the market. And, and so I think you could almost say the same in many ways about culture, um, but but we had to do that as a brand, as, as a product, as an employer, Um, and we had to think holistically about our cultural principles as well. How do these fit into the context of the French workplace, the Japanese workplace? Does that yeah, resonate with you? Yeah, well, I think that, that actually is an interesting to bring on to move into this the the next category now, which is so we already talked about talent density. Talent density is the first thing that you need to the the first requirement for freedom. The second requirement for freedom is a culture of candor of open feedback and of um, of telling people exactly what you what what's on your mind. And when I started working with Netflix in 2015, it was right before they went through this big international expansion. And I was had already experienced this candor in my interviews. I mean, sometimes I would go into interviews with people and they would say, they would say, Oh yeah, can I give you some feedback? <laughs> and I would say, wait, I just met you. <laughs> and then they would give me feedback about something about the book or whatever, my first book. Um, so I remember, like, as someone who specializes in national cultural differences, I thought that will never work internationally. And of course, in the Netherlands, it's fine. Yeah. In fact, the Dutch that I interviewed would laugh at the Americans saying, oh, they think they're candid, <laughs> but they don't actually know candor. But um, the other had the other big offices for Netflix in Tokyo, in Singapore, and in Sao Paulo, all areas of the world that are much, much less direct uh, with feedback. I was very concerned Uh, about how that was going to roll out. And I'll tell you what happened, which was that at the beginning, there was this kind of idea, um, okay, well, we'll just hire the most direct people that we can in those countries, and then we'll train them. And um, I remember people from the U.S. going out to Tokyo and uh, like trying to teach them to give feedback the American way. And they actually, they were doing it, but they were also, root, it was ruining all of the relationships. So there was a very un- aggressive, undesirable culture the first couple of years in Tokyo. But then I think there was really a lot of learning and a, this big shift. And the, the learning was, okay, we'll keep the principle the same. Like we need to have candor no matter where we are. But the behaviors that we practice in these different countries, they need to be grown locally. So, you know, Japanese and the Japanese in Japan and the Brazilians in Sao Paulo, you know, get together and figure out like, what does candid feedback look like here? 
And how are you going to give the feedback in a way that's going to preserve the relationship and create a, a positive environment? Uh, and then we as leaders, and here's, I think, where we're going back to Alex's point, the leaders in the organization have to be flexible uh, enough to be able to adapt their style to the different cultures that they're working with, recognizing that the principle, we keep the same but the behaviors are, are adapted locally. And Erin, I have a question because there's a lot of, uh, about uh, safety, psycho psychological fa safety, sorry for the word. <laughs> uh, but um, how, uh, how about the trust? Are there uh, some cultures who have trust issues they don't give uh, the, the, the open and honest feedback? Yeah, well, I think what we can think about, like, how do I create a, a team culture yeah. that might be different than the local culture? So let me just, like... Um, go back to what I learned doing that research in Tokyo, Netflix. So when they were kind of stopping people in the hall and giving feedback, things weren't working so well. But the one thing they did really well in Netflix Japan was what uh, the one thing I thought would never work there. Mm -hmm. And that was these uh, these live 360 feedback dinners where you would get together. I mean, they, this is, you know, born out of California. You would get together over a, for the evening and give feedback to one another in front of the group. And I thought, you know, that is the most un-Japanese thing that you could imagine, that people would never want to do that. But actually, it was interesting because it seemed that, well, For the Japanese employees, that was preferable. What was preferable would be that we would all know when we were going to give the feedback. We would know why we were going to give the feedback and how we were going to give the feedback. And we would all get really ready. And then we would come in and we would follow the culture of the company. And they were really good at it. Uh, what wasn't so great was the kind of spontaneity. So I think that that's a great example of how organizational culture can be um, can be really molded to fit the the local cultures, but it might not be the way you expect. And how was it, was it for you, Alex, uh, to get this feedback, to do these diners? You told uh, on the stage uh, about gendered feedback. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think one thing you have to be really careful about um, when you're in an environment where uh, constant, like Aaron said, sometimes spontaneous mm -hmm. in the moment feedback is encouraged, it's very easy to let biases get in the way. And so a layer that we added at Netflix, which I think was invaluable to, to the, the success, the continued success of the culture was always putting an inclusion lens on, on the feedback that we were giving. Um, that doesn't mean that people still didn't say the wrong thing, that people still didn't mess up. Um, and you have to leave room for that. But I do think that when you look at everything through the lens of inclusion, and when you really spend time as, as a leader, most importantly, to understand the context, um, cultural context, the background, the experiences of the people that you're working with, then you're going to be able to actually tailor your feedback in a way that's going to land in a way that really makes sense for that person. So I think, with, I mean, as far as gender goes, of course, this whole culture of candor is actually quite complicated because we know from so much research that when women are uh, when women provide direct candid feedback they are much more likely to be seen as aggressive uh, than men who are seen as uh, professional or assertive so that in itself requires a lot of focus uh, and I and I actually did see that when I was doing the interviews yep. there that there would you know like this woman was fired because she was really direct and then people said well she's really aggressive and they have another I mean a great saying at Netflix I love it no brilliant jerks mm -hmm. right so no brilliant jerks is like for, the first thing we do is if you're a poor collaborator and you're you're not a nice person it doesn't matter how good you are you don't you can't stay but this does get complicated. This is a whole this is a whole podcast right? in itself, right? Because yeah. right. like like a woman who was giving feedback in a way that she saw her male colleagues giving feedback would then be fired for being a brilliant jerk. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that, I mean that's a whole different story, but that's the complication of of a candid of trying to promote candid feedback in in an international environment. Uh, as you said, Alex, I think we can make this in a, into a three-hour podcast yes. where there's so much yes. uh, I mean, to even, talk about. I'm serious. Just on gendered feedback. I'm yeah. here for it. Yeah. Invite Aaron yeah. back and, and we're on uh, it. <laughs> but you are all on a tight schedule, so we're going to wrap up. I'm going to ask the same question to both of you. 
uh, you were both on the main stage. Uh, what do you hope the audience will take away from your talk and and think about Aaron can you go first yeah and maybe I'll just make a little bit of a, a mention of, of because we are in the Netherlands that there are parts of this model that work really well in the, the Netherlands and parts of it that work a little bit less well and I think I mean the candor part is kind of like a natural here so in general okay in the Dutch culture there's a really a strong emphasis on the importance of direct and transparent feedback so that part works great the other part that works works great is actually the freedom so or empowerment let's say that so we're in one of the most egalitarian countries in the world here so the idea of pushing decision making down in the organization i mean people love that that resonates really well but the part that's a little less dutch is that i mean this is a, a culture that puts a lot of emphasis on on efficiency and structure and what goes with efficiency is having those those processes that we all follow or the policies we all know what we do and what we don't do so i mean one of the images that i loved at netflix was we are a jazz band not an orchestra and i do believe that the Netherlands is an orchestra, right? <laughs> Meaning that like, like you like yeah. things to be really well coordinated. You want things to happen in order on time. And we all come to work and we follow the, we follow the orchestra. Um, and there are other countries, of course, like India or Brazil, which tend to be more of a jazz band. Right? <laughs> things are a little bit more chaotic and people operate, as Reed said in the video today, operate on the edge of chaos. So I think that's maybe where the biggest learning can come for your Dutch listeners is that um, actually, if we're going after innovation and agility, sometimes we might need to let go of some of that tight coordination and efficiency and let the messiness come in, let go of the processes and policies. Less predictable. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Because innovation lives in an, an unpredictable space. Alex, have you something to add? Yeah, I'll go rogue here. Um, this is not something I've said today, but I'm going to steal something from from Aaron because I think what's a little bit dangerous with all of this is um, people walking away and wanting to copy and paste the the underlying principles of Netflix culture into their own organizations. And it just doesn't work everywhere, and that's okay. Um, if we zoom out, I'd love to go back to what Aaron said in her keynote, which is what is so important for companies to do when they're thinking about culture is to... First of all, be clear and concise around what are your principles and your values that drive specific behaviors and that drive your decision-making. And be wary of choosing values or principles that are absolute positives. Was that, was that how you said it? Um, and I love that because I think that is something that organizations they can do tomorrow. You can take a look at your culture document, whatever you have written down, and you can say, do, do we have a bunch of absolute positives here, Right. Um, and I love the notion of making strategic bets around what are the tensions that we are going to be willing to make choices around um, that are going to drive our business forward. And those are our cultural values. And those are our cultural principles. And that's what we hire, we fire, and we promote by. And those are how we make our strategic business decisions. Wow. Both very, very good insight at the end of this podcast. Uh, I think uh, we would love to have you to keep you longer here, but uh, we have to wrap this up. Uh, Aaron, Alexis, thank you very much for your time. We'll now switch to the main stage and we'll listen to a part of Aaron and Alex talk on the main stage. At Netflix, they started doing something which I know is very provocative, but I think is also quite interesting, something that they call the keeper test. And the keeper test basically is just a little, a little something that you can do even if you like today or this evening in your hotel room and, or at your homes, and that's you go for a little walk and you ask yourself a question like, if Stanley on my team came into my office and he told me that he was leaving the organization, how would I feel? I mean, if Stanley told you he was leaving, would you be devastated? Would you say, oh no, Stanley, don't leave me? Would you do everything you could to fight to keep Stanley on the team? If so, well then you know he's the right person for the spot. Would you feel relieved? 
would you think, oh good, now I don't have to deal with those problems. Would you feel excited thinking about who you could get on the spot or now that you could spend your energy focused on your top performers instead of all of your energy on Stanley? Now, I think if you would feel, in truth, either relieved or excited when one of your employees tells you that they're leaving the team, that's probably a signal that you need to do something else, which is to ask yourself the question, have I given Stanley the coaching and feedback that he needs to succeed? And if you haven't given it, you better go give it right now. But if you have given it, and you have been giving it, and you would still feel relieved or excited, well, I think it's a clear signal that something needs to happen, or whatever that might be for you. Well, I think Aaron already talked about scheduling the meetings yeah. for feedback. So I would absolutely recommend that. One thing I would say that you can do tomorrow Try oversharing a little bit. Um, share a little bit more information and context. And that might be about the business. That might be you showing a little, a little bit of vulnerability as a leader. Um, that might be you walking your team or your colleagues through your thinking and bringing them along with you. Um, and see what happens. And that goes back to the, for, for me and my experience at Netflix, the notion of context and not control. Um, so I would, I would say try oversharing a bit and just and, and see what um, what dynamics change in your team for, for better or for worse. Thank you for listening to this episode of Denk Denk, the podcast from Denk Producties. This conversation was recorded on Amsterdam Business Forum, the biggest leadership event in the Netherlands. The 2024 edition of Amsterdam Business Forum will be held on the 27th of September and will host fabulous speakers as Adam Grant and Brené Brown. For more information, go to denkproducties.nl. For now, thanks again for listening and don't forget to subscribe. Hope to see you next time.